Wonderful Tom Lewis, who we are very, very lucky to have here tonight. And we're going to be talking about a topic that I am really, really interested in because my passion about arthritis started at endpoint, started at terminal. But let's rewind. Where does it come from? Why have we got this epidemic of chronic pain and a huge percentage of these dogs suffering from arthritis? Where does it come from? This dude is here to tell us all about it. So, Tom, introduce yourself so people know what your background is and how they can trust you. Okay, hi there. Yeah, I'm Tom Lewis. I'm uh, the Kennel Club's um, genetics research manager um, and uh, a, a quantitative geneticist by training, um, which is uh, which is a mouthful, but it basically looks at the genetic in populations and um, particularly with um, livestock sort of selection that's where it kind of comes from so selection of dairy cattle and, and chickens things like that um and i did my phd um back a few years ago at roslyn and nottingham um on pig data and then moved to the animal health trust afterwards to do a project funded by the kennel club charitable trust on um uh hip scores in labradors and also uh syringomida in cavaliers and i've been oh. working on dogs ever since so uh, do, you know yeah. do you know yeah. Pat? Ah, yeah. small worlds. First, She's on scene. Our first papers together. <laughs> awesome. So. Oh, I love the networking, networking. Um, great. So you've already just said a word, hips. And that's a really good place for us to start, I think, because most people hear and understand hip dysplasia. But for people that go, I don't know what she's talking about, hip dysplasia is when dogs with their their ball and socket joint it is not the perfect fit and it's not a nice snug fit and it's actually a shallow acetabulum so a shallow socket um, and therefore as they develop it isn't that perfect fit so there's at birth there is some laxity so that there's more movement and as the dog grows instead of them growing together in a perfect fit because there is laxity there's movement here you start to kind of get this remodeling. So you get a shallow bowl and you get an abnormal head. Not good for arthritis. Causes abnormal forces. That causes the um, process of degeneration and inflammation to start, which leads into arthritis. And to bring it home to reality, only about two months ago, one of my clients, new clients to me, Willow, six-month-old yellow Labrador, had hips that looked like a 10-year-old they were horrendous there was already a huge amount of osteophytes so that's new bone growth a lot of pain a lot of dysfunction the dog had bandy legs elastic band legs they were all over the show there was no stability and this dog's got 12 years ahead of it so it's a really big problem tell us about hip dysplasia the genetics blah 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 let's start somewhere and let's see where we go so I guess the, the the first place to start is is that hip dysplasia is a, is a, is what we call a complex disease. Mm -hmm. So dogs in particular, um, dog breeds suffer from um, a, a, quite a, a large number of single gene or simple um, genetic diseases. Things like uh, PRA, progressive retinal atrophy, or hereditary cataract. So these are diseases that within a particular breed are entirely and solely caused by uh, variants at a single gene and if you have two of the, the the dodgy variants then you get the disease and if you don't you don't um, and if you're carrying one you're healthy but half your offspring inherit it and so that's how it how it comes on and, and, and the, the tragedy was that is that apparently two healthy dogs can give rise to to affected offspring so that's one classical sort of genetic disease but Hip dysplasia is, is, is undoubtedly has a genetic influence, but it's messy. It's much more complex. There's a, a large number of environmental factors, which I, I'm, I'm guessing you will be very well aware we, of. I'm going uh, to add them. I'm going to tag them in later. <laughs> your, your genetic one. Yes. Yeah. So, so those, 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 are, those are, um, are on top. But underneath that, there is um, genetic variation. So there's more than just one gene that's involved. Um, the presence of environmental influences makes it difficult because we don't have clear affected and unaffected characteristics. We have that sort of severity. And you talked just there about this dog that has really severe um, malformation and, and, and osteoarthritis. Um, but we might see mild 
arthritis, we might see mild laxity as well as severe laxity. And, and, and so we have this sort of spectrum of, 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 of severity. Um, and, and that is caused by, uh, as well as the environment, um, is caused by a number of, uh, of genes um, working um, to, to produce that genetic variation. So it's like thinking in human terms, we have, we have diseases like cystic fibrosis, which is that very simple. You get two copies of, of the, you know, two of the wrong copies and you get the disease versus things like heart disease, where we know that there's smoking, exercise, diet, all that. But also we all have an inherent genetic risk and, and that risk varies um, across populations i may have a very low genetic risk of heart disease um, you may have a higher one but because you run and you eat better than i do and that you know you you actually may be at lower risk of a heart attack or of high blood pressure yeah. and hip dysplasia is the same sort of thing so we have a large number of genes involved we think and they're very difficult to to find individually and even if you do find them individually each one of them doesn't have very much impact on on the, the risk of disease itself. We want to look at the genetics as a whole. Right, you want to look at the big picture and bring it together. Okay, so again, for people that are like, well, what is this about? They're, they're really new to the whole thing. Their dog's only just been diagnosed with arthritis. They've stumbled across CAM. They're kind of trying to learn more about it. What kind of breeds are we talking about that are really commonly um, presented as you know with hip dysplasia what what breeds are they it tends to be um, medium to large breeds so um, classically things like retrievers labrador retrievers golden retrievers <clears throat> dogs of a similar size um, german shepherds mm -hmm. um, flat coat retrievers uh, are, are, are sometimes have a, a, a risk bernie's mountain dogs newfoundland some of the heavier dogs as well um so um liam burger bull mastiffs the, the the bigger dogs the heavier dogs i think there might be an indication or or, or a, a um a, a slight indication that it's the physical size that that impacts on the laxity and causes that bone that, that that abnormal weight distribution if you have a very small light dog maybe that laxity can exist without having the um having the consequences that we see in terms of weight distribution bone wearing osteophyte growth and all that and then the lameness that we we associate as, as the yeah. end point of the disease it's 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 a bit unclear at the moment because there's not a great deal of screening that goes on no. for uh, small dogs because they don't appear to have the end the end problem which is the which is the lameness so absolutely you know i haven't i have never done hip scores for a, a yorkshire terrier <laughs> <No>. <laughs> just not on anybody's radar <laughs> yeah, absolutely. yeah so like hip dysplasia because you're the man that knows when did we start being aware about it was it in the late 1800s early 1900s what was it that the first, the first papers, I think, some of the sort of seminal papers are, are back in the 60s, actually. So a, a paper by Hodgman, um, okay. I think in 1963, which describes um, hip dysplasia in, um, in some of those breeds, probably the Labrador. I can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, and for a long time, there was uh, a scoring scheme or a screening scheme, um, I think, run by the BVA and possibly by the Kennel Club as well. No, in fact, it was Bob Kennel Club as well because it recently celebrated its 50 year 50 year anniversary, um, and that took a, a certain format up until about the early 1980s, and then it became the the scheme um, transformed into to how we know it today into the yeah. same format that it's scored today. Um, so yeah, we have that nice long continuum of data spanning back to the to to, to the 80s which is amazing so what what is the scoring so for people that are completely new to this what do you mean by this scoring i'm not going to butt in and let you <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a vet so I, I'll, I'll try and uh, I'm, I'm familiar with the scheme but when it comes to the specifics i, I mean oh no don't go specific just, 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 just but, keep it um, simple yeah so you take your dog to um, your vet who will take an x-ray of the dog in a, in a uh, lying down position. Um, and that x-ray will then be sent to the BVA. And at the BVA, they have a hip score panel, which consists of um, radiologists and um, uh, orthopedic surgeons who are um, highly skilled and, and qualified in, in looking at these x-rays. 
And they take a number of, well, they take some measurements and they make some evaluations on nine different features of each hip. So one of those is, um, uh, as you said earlier, the, the um, acetabulum and, and, and how, how much of the femoral head is kind of contained within the acetabulum. And that's uh, a feature called subluxation. And they score each one of these features from zero, which is no abnormality whatsoever, up to six, which is, indicates a, a severe degree of abnormality, except for one feature, which they score up to five. I don't yeah. know why, but it's just up to five. Um, so those add up to um, a score out of 53 for each hip, um, out of 106 in total. Um, and that score is then reported back um, left, right and total yeah. um, back to the um, owner. Um, and if the dog is kennel club registered, um, then that score automatically gets passed on to the kennel club. And they are that score is recorded against that dog's details um, and we could we provide that score make that score publicly available um, both online and in in paper format in the um, I think the breed record supplement um, so for people to catch up we're trying to go for the lowest score um, that's right yeah so we're trying to get dogs that are you know like Luna's just been scored um last year and she was seven out of 103 so that's good that's good um one of Kamal's other dogs got naught not not so happy. <laughs> I know total competition, but the higher the score, the more dysplastic. Let's get the terminology right. Dysplastic the hips are, and the more likely they are going to become an arthritic problem earlier. So the the less well fitting that joint is, the more likely it's going to turn into an arthritic joint and the more likely it's therefore going to be painful and something that is going to be difficult to manage. I keep saying likely is because there's so much variation in that. I've seen 12 year old Labradors that come in and they've got the horrendous hips, but they still tail wagging. They're still like, yeah, man, it's all right. I know they're not working, but I don't care. <laughs> and then you have a younger dog who has got actually very mild signs, but they're crippled. So we keep saying likely because every dog is unique. And I say when I do my owner workshops, every dog is a snowflake. They're unique. So we're talking about likelihood. And this is why it's really, really important that we understand this because it's something that we can do something about. So if you could have anything happen what would it be like i'm trying to push you and say get everybody to hip score before they breed i'm totally setting you up for that one um what what's the benefit of hip scoring what what will we achieve so so as you as you said um we, we, we're looking at um we we make decisions on which dogs to breed um based on the, the evidence that's available to us now mm -hmm. In some respects, that, that, that may be quite easy. If we're going to breed greyhounds, then you, you, you breed the fastest greyhound. That's what you're, you're after. Um, if you're breeding a, a sheepdog, you can see how it's herding sheep and you can, you can um, breed from the, 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 best, um, the best herder. Um, so when we're looking, considering something like hip dysplasia, as you said, we would look at the dog, but we would want to see how it's behaving, how, how affected it is at, 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 at its... Um, in its, in its, uh, when it's a, an old dog, um, mm. we want to see that it doesn't have any hip dysplasia when it's nine, 10, 11 years old. Um, the trouble is we breed from before that age. And you've mm. also said we may have dogs that, that don't show lameness, but actually have pretty horrendous hips. There's a lot of variation in a lot of different components. So what the scoring, the screening scheme does is it allows us to evaluate the degree of laxity in, in the joints at a, at a young age. So the minimum age to participate is one year old. You can't get your dogs um, hip scored before one year old um, because I don't think they're, they're considered to be um, mature um, and the hips fully developed. But once they are, then, then, then you can have the dog hip scored. And the score will tell you, particularly if you get the breakdown of the score in the different features, it will tell you how much laxity there is in the, that dog's hips. Um, and how much um, bone growth, remodeling, osteoarthritis there is as well. That's developmental, and so that might not occur till later, but we can mm. see that degree of laxity. And the laxity is really the, 
the 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 fundamental problem that triggers everything else to to kind of come after it um and so it allows you to to look at that laxity in a dog that's one to two years old and to say you know what that laxity is low enough for me to say i want to breed from from this dog this is a this is good or this is too high and therefore i'm not going to breed from it and so it gives you extra information about that dog at an earlier age that, that allows you then to, to make breeding decisions based on um, the likely consequences of the degree of laxity in, the, in those hips. So that's great. But the problem is you can have dogs, two dogs with really good hips that still can have progeny that have poor hips, which nicely steps us into estimated breeding value which I must admit, it wasn't only to about two years ago when I was reading and, you know, writing the website. Well, no, that's about four, five years ago that I started going, oh, my God, there's more to this. Tell them about EBVs because that's what's amazing. And then I'm going to lead into why we need people to be doing this with these predisposed breeds. So tell them about EBVs. Okay, so we have... Um... Uh, the uh, uh, so we have the degree of variation in the score. So let's say you know, we have two dogs that, that, that are scored uh, at the same age, uh, let's say two years old, and they have the same score. So outwardly, those dogs um, look as though they have a similar risk of hip dysplasia or a genetic risk of hip dysplasia. But I'm going to come back to the environment for a minute and say that if we knew that one of those dogs had been overfed had been over exercised at the wrong age had been fed the wrong stuff maybe even had fallen down the stairs or something then we would say well hang on a second that dog had quite a lot of detrimental environmental influences on its hips and yet it's got the same score as a dog that had been very benign environmental influences so if we adjust for that then we could perhaps legitimately conclude that the dog that has all this um, detrimental environmental influence actually had a low genetic risk to start with mm. uh, a lower underlying genetic risk and that's what that's what we we we, we essentially are working on is, is is the sort of the architecture of this trait in a population is that we have genetic variation running the population there are some that have a very very high genetic risk and some that have a very very low genetic risk mm. um, but those sort of risks zigzag through life being influenced environmentally for better or for worse until you get to the day where that, that dog is, has its x-ray and is scored. Mm. And we want to find the low genetic risk um, dogs because it's only the genetics that's passed on to the next generation. Mm. So the hip score is great because it gives us that insight, that early insight into the dog's hip condition. But the, um, the genetics is, is, is even more crucial because it allows us to take that snapshot and say, oh, OK, but we're going to correct this for um, environmental influence, try and screen off that, that environmental influence and get to the genetics, which is what's inherited by this dog's offspring. To do that, what we rely on is a huge amount of data, which is what we have from the hip score scheme, which is great. So we have a, a large amount, a large number of hip scores. And because the Kennel Club has the pedigree that connects all these dogs together, we can take that data and we can use that to determine the degree of relationship between every dog that has a, a hip score and those dogs which don't. Yeah. And essentially, we can kind of regress that information on that matrix of relationships, which this gets a bit complicated here, but this is just trying to tell you about the guts of the, the, guts of the calculation. Yeah. But we can use all that information on a dog and its relatives to calculate that dog's genetic risk. And to give you a really sort of simple example, so let's go back to two dogs and we say, okay, we've got two dogs here with um, the same hip score. Um, they were scored on the same day. And we have one dog which has, and they both have, they both have 10 offspring. Now one dog, the average score from its offspring is, is, uh, is, is 50. And the other dog, the average score from his offspring is five. Mm. So we, despite them having the same hip score themselves, we can see that one dog has much, much better progeny scores than the other. Mm -hmm. And that's likely to do to do with genetics. So we're using that relative that information on relatives and relatives shared genes with each other to to inform about other other dogs. Um, 
to the extent that we can we can even estimate the genetic risk of a of a dog that doesn't have its own hip score based mm. purely on on um, the hip scores of its of its relatives and that may seem kind of crazy but backtrack a minute to, to, to right back at the beginning when I was introducing myself and this this kind of this kind of science came from livestock breeding particularly dairy breeding where of course they're estimating um, milk traits for bulls and bulls don't give milk because yeah. they're male <laughs> yet they're on the strength of the number of daughters they have you're you're talking about you know milk yield um, estimates for for these for these you know prize winning black and white bulls um even though they can't give those traits themselves yeah. based purely on the information on their relatives. And so that's the same, the same mechanism that we're looking at um, for, uh, for, for hip That scoring. doesn't mean that people can stop hip scoring and rely on pre no. so This is only work <laughs> if people do this. And I, I'm blown away by this. Like I'm going to put a link to the paper from Frontiers that I read today. It's, it's, it's pretty meaty. You know, it took me a while and about three cups of coffee. And I was like, oh, my God, there's too many numbers in this. Um, but I'm going to put the link down, guys, because it's really, really worth reading because it's it's fascinating. Um, and looking at confidence levels as well. So the more information that you have in their past and what's happened from them, the more confidence we have in the, the facts and figures about the EBV, the estimated breeding value. Um, what frustrates me a little bit is because I'm so passionate about preventing this endpoint to OA, this suffering, it is suffering. And we have this ability to prevent suffering. And we're not talking for three weeks, four weeks, we're talking years of pain management that I really want people to know about this so that people can action it. Um, so if you're an owner and you're thinking about getting a new dog, we need to be requesting this information from the breeder so that the breeders then do join these schemes because at the moment there's still a little bit hoo-ha about whether you actually have to do them or not and whether you have to submit isn't there so explain to people about this bit so that they can understand so yeah i mean the the the, uh, the kennel club doesn't insist if you're registering your dog with the kennel club the kennel club doesn't insist that that, that there are any health tests done on that um, because primarily it's a registry registration body that being said as i said we're able to use the pedigree information that we have to estimate genetic groups in dogs that haven't been scored so there is there is value in us being able to to, to gather that information um, if you go to assured breeders um, so the kennel club assured scheme is set up to to in uh, to um uh, give confidence to puppy buyers that if they go to an assured breeder, they will have done all the health tests that are required for the particular breed that they're breeding. So yeah. for Labradors, that will include hip scores for golden retrievers, for German shepherds. Those those will be will be hip scores, um, among various other DNA tests, and also to meet general high standards of of um, whelping and, and and puppy care. Yeah. Um, a lot of breeders ascribe to those standards but are not members of the assured breeder scheme but through the assured breeder scheme you're able to be sure that those those standards have been met so in an ideal world i would love everyone to to even even people who are, are owning a pet dog to get their dog mm -hmm. hip scored and and um pass that information back because all that information tells us not only about that particular dog and if it's been neutered you're not going to breed from it but that information tells us about its parents about its siblings and, and, mm. and that's really valuable but i recognize that you know if i own a, a pet dog i'm not necessarily going to take it take it back and get it hip scored and go pay pay all that expense just just, just but if fun. they were being neutered um so just with absolute you know um rose tinted glasses on if they were being neutered they are under an anesthetic and it is a perfect opportunity to get said data and the fee is 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 nominal and it is a way for people to give back and start challenging. I'm going to say it, challenging this horrendous disease, horrendous disease. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it is a bit of a shame that we don't have to. I can understand there are financial aspects, et cetera. Um, can people have their the hips scored and not send in? 
They can, unfortunately. Um, that's, that's something that, that the uh, the BA hip scoring panel is is, is well aware of and has, has, has been discussing for a while different measures to try and um, block that off. Um, because even um, uh, uh, all data is valuable. And, and, and so, you know, it's um, it, it may be that that the the um, the score isn't as bad as the as the vet taking the X-ray thinks. Um, mm. It may be that the, the vet taking the X-ray isn't an expert in radiology or. or um, and it or might not be that they haven't got bad intention. They're just saying, you know, oh, look, we've just spent 200 quid on, you know, doing a sedate X-rays. Do you really want to spend another 60 because you're going to get a high score? Just don't breed from them. Yeah. So it, it might be. Yeah be bad intention at all but for the greater good i sound like hot fuzz don't i for the greater good and um, it would be good to actually kind of go through the process and even if they're poor scores that data is really really quite important um absolutely definitely it's really important and um yeah you'd hope you'd hope that people wouldn't breed from them if it's if it's bad enough not to risk sending it in then you'd hope that they they wouldn't be bred from yeah. but um yeah and i think there's so much to cover. I'm trying to pave a path in my head of how we're going to cover everything. I think the next bit that would be sensible to cover is this frontier paper where you've actually shown that it's working. So explain to people what you released. Was it only a month ago? It's not long ago that you... Uh, a couple of months, yeah, yeah. It came out in January. So, yeah. Um, so it's, uh, it's a paper looking at, um, looking at the, the, hip, the hip score data that we have in i think it was six breeds um so that was the labrador the golden retriever the german shepherd i think the rottweiler the bernese mountain dog uh, and the newfoundland um and looking at various parameters such as um the total number of dogs born per year that have a score um the mean average of that score the median the mode um, standard deviation which is a measure of sort of spread um and um the 75th percentile so one thing um it's probably important to mention about the the um distribution of hip scores in in a population is it, it's not a nice normal bell curve it's not a symmetrical bell curve that we, we often um, associate with biological data it has a long tail at one end it's quite skewed so you, we said earlier that it goes runs from zero to 106 but actually the mean average scores are usually between about 10 and 18 for a particular breed so that's yeah. right down at the low end and that's because a lot of the features are um uh, are scored on the extent of remodeling and osteoarthritis, which are developmental, and they tend to be scored quite young. Um, and they're scored on the extent of severity from from normal. So we don't tend to get very many sixes, um, repeat sixes. So you tend to have this long tail. So it's quite a sort of skewed distribution. Anyway, so we measure all those things, um, and the 75th percentile is important because it gives us a sort of marker out out here rather than in the main the main guts of the of the of the distribution. Um, we looked at that. We looked at the genetic trend by the by the EBVs um, in those breeds, and we looked at the dogs that were used for breeding. So we looked at the size and dams of of dogs born per year, and we looked at their hip scores. How many of them were hip scored, and the the, the, the parameters of the score of, of of those dogs. So we did that from 1990, I think, till it's 20, a massive 20, project. 20, 20. Yes. <laughs> How long were you guys so, doing this? Well, it, it wasn't it wasn't too big actually. It's, it's um we, we did it we did it with we did it with lots of we did it some more breeds first and, and that, that paper was too busy and there's some inter there was some interesting stuff in other breeds as well that, that, that we could talk about if we have time. But um it generally shows across most of those six breeds, in fact it's across all of them I think to be fair, that there's there's a general improvement mm -hmm. both in the rates of scoring, um, particularly amongst parents, which is what we're interested in. You know, as I said, I can understand a pet owner not necessarily scoring getting their dog hip scored but you you do want um breeders to have scored before they're before they're deciding which stock to breed with um so we're seeing an improvement in the rates of scoring and a general improvement in um in the in the hip scores of of dogs being born so those scores are coming down and what yes, we're and really you seeing less of the tail, so you're seeing less of the severe ones yeah yeah the tails really being pulled in 
Yeah. And, and I found what I found the... interesting as well, though, sorry to butt in, is that when well, it was the Bernese Mountain Dog, you saw a real improvement and it's now tapered and plateaued where yeah. like, the, the, the breed ambassadors were like, this is terrible. We need to do something about this. And they all got on board in the 90s, maybe. And now it's kind of tapered off where other breeds, they're still the you know improving the number of people that are doing the scoring it's very fascinating yeah it, it, yeah it did it did it did plateau in a lot of them actually and and, and that's that's something that you know that it's what data tells you and it, it, it means that we now know that actually maybe you know we want to have a drive that there's there's you know 50 to 60 percent of, of 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 people or 50 60 percent of, of breeding stock is being scored but actually we want to make that push and try and encourage yeah. the, the rest of them to really do it as well because that's probably where you know the problem might be coming from yeah um, so that that paper was awesome in that it gives us hope that this is worth investment investment in time it's gonna for the greater good for the whole breed um let's answer some questions just here and then we're going to head to elbows so we've had blah blah blah. thank you some tuesday evening learning in lockdown hello melissa nice to see you um already hip scored we're going to get on to the elbows next lynn um can hip scores change as the dog ages or once they reach skeletal maturity do they stay the same hopefully we've kind of answered that but please explain yeah, they, 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 I mean, they definitely would change um, because as, if, as, as the degree of um, developmental um, problems uh, develop, uh, so the osteoarthritis, the bone remodeling, if you've got a dog scored at, at 365 days and then scored it again at, um, at, uh, at, at 10 years old, then you would expect to see, you'd be unlikely to, to, to have them exactly the same. Um, but I guess the degree to which they change would be dependent on, on all sorts of things. But under the screening scheme, um, that you're only allowed to have your dog scored once. Um, mm. And I think that's to, to try and avoid people trying to get repeat screens to then try and try and get a lower score. Um, mm. I think it's also worth mentioning just at the moment, you know, when it, when it, when it comes to estimated breeding values, we, we limit the amount of data that we use and we limit the data to dogs that are under four years old. So over one year old and under four years old when they're scored. And the reason why we limit that is because about 90% of dogs typically across all breeds are fall within that age range when they're scored and when we did some really early work looking at how the, the genetic relationship of the scores in young dogs and old dogs that relationship kind of weakens a bit and if you think about it, it's not very surprising because in the young dogs we're primarily looking at the laxity if mm. those you know the remodeling and the, the things that develop haven't had a chance to develop um, we're primarily looking at just the laxity whereas in the older dogs we might be looking at more arthritis and the development of the osteophytes mm. and the bone remodeling. Now they're not the same thing necessarily. They might be related and one might be dependent on the other to a certain extent, but that relationship kind of weakens a bit. And so right, we wanted to keep that, we, we took the decision to make that a, a sort of much more solid trait um, with the bulk of data in, in, in the sort of one to four year old dogs. Um, and so we, we limit it to that. So if you, if you get your dog scored at seven, eight years old, that's great, and it will give you a lot of information about how to manage that dog as it approaches its its old age. Um, but that data, unfortunately, can't be used in the estimated breeding no. value. So I just want to make people aware of that at the moment. It's a dry de technical reason, unfortunately. <laughs> Wouldn't it be amazing if you could score them when they're young, and then you have cohorts of dogs that go off for different lifestyles? And so maybe you've got a big cohort of border collies, and some go off and do agility, some go off and do you know, herding, some are just pets and see the impact, that would just, oh God, that would just be- If we could do that, that, that would be amazing. And you'd potentially be able to identify those dogs that are, you know, bone growers, those dogs that have that that sort of, you know, that osteoarthritic response to the laxity, you know, and, and, and there, there's gonna be variation at, at, yeah. at all those links along that chain from laxity to remodeling to, to the bone growth to lameness you know there'll be genetic variation in all those links um, but yeah. the fundamental one is the laxity and so that's what we're kind of focusing on that's what we're focusing on um what about elbows we're going to come on to that next the kennel club should insist no well but it's a bit more complicated than that um what about crossbreeds do they have average scores is there anything for crossbreeds um there, there are yeah there, i mean the, the, the scheme is open to, to to i think to to any dog um we uh accrue um the data the bva send us the data that that of all dogs that kennel club registered so that includes 
anything on the breed register, but also anything that's on what we call the activity register. And so those are dogs that are competing in um, uh, agility, fly ball, um, things like that, um, that we don't necessarily have the complete pedigree for, but they, they need that, that registration to compete. So right. we have that information. You can find that information on our website for those named dogs. But because we don't have the pedigree, we can't use them in the genetic study. So right. it's a bit annoying. Um, as far as crossbreeds go, yeah, I mean, absolutely. You get dogs like the, the Labradoodle, so it's Poodle and Labrador. Now, they both are at risk from, from hip dysplasia. And so Labradoodles, you know, will, 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 get, the same, will get the same disease. And um, I think, that, I'm pretty sure there's, there's, um, there's studies showing that as well. So, um, yeah, they, 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 they will, unfortunately. And the scoring remains a good way to to manage that risk i mean that you said labradoodles so you're only talking to laura eldridge who um is very into <laughs> two dogs. perfect it's just like clockwork um hannah leach um i wish i'd thought of giving i wish i'd thought of having my um german shepherd hip scored when neutered parents grandparents had decent scores but i'm fairly sure his aunt will x-ray at some point and be sure to send them to the casey so the casey will only take them if the dog is x-rayed under four so is that true so hannah well, well, really, like we'll, she we'll, do. we'll definitely take that they'll, they'll definitely be passed to us if it's a kennel club registered dog but they can only be used in the ebv calculation if they're if they're under four years old when they're when they're mm -hmm. scored so um that, yeah, this, it might be slightly confusing. On the, on the health test results finder, which is on the Kennel Club website, you can put in any named dog that we have and you'll find the health test results for, for that dog. And that's not just hip scores, that's eye tests, that's DNA tests, that's everything. Um, uh, respiratory function grading for the, for the brachystalics. Um, but uh, yeah, when I come to do the estimated breeding values, I have to, I have to trim that data to the, to the four years old. Okay. So you'll still have a, an EBV, but it's but it's um its own score won't have been included in the data that's calculated. That. Yeah, um, lots of pets are being muted as pups, aren't they? Um, don't know where you're going with that one, Rose. You know, right again. I'm not sure where that one's leading, Lynn. It depends where you mean. What is your case in the UK? Blah, 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 blah. Um. I don't know if you can read these. It is a difficult one. We kept three litter mates, had hip scores from mum, who was three and four, and a good stud dog had hip scores of six, four, six, three, six, twelve. The latter, who was a 40 kilo dog, as opposed to 30 kilos of the other two, developed arthritis at about five years of age. He was also the last born. Um, birthing started at 7 p.m. and he was born at 10 the following morning. Yeah, well, I think, Louise, you're really demonstrating that. Yes, it is. It's not a pure science. There's lots of other factors that are involved. And it's it's one part of, let's keep saying this word, toolbox. It's one of our tools to try and actually start dealing with the diseases. At source, could I say that? I, I guess I can. Um, I have a, a bee in my bonnet that we're very reactive about OA rather than proactive. And this is why this is featuring in CAM, is I want people to start joining the dots, I didn't. I really didn't join the dots between learning um, in the orthopedic lectures about the different forms of dysplasia. There was this, this ravine between that and then the lecture notes about arthritis. I don't think they were done on the same day. I don't think there was a connection. Your brain just didn't do the two. And then when it does, you're like, good God, this is so important. Um, hello, Alison, nice to see you. Luna, the Varmarana has just been diagnosed with arthritis in elbow and knee. Oh, there's not more to come. I'll hear more from you, Alison, in a minute. Um, so we've done talking about hip dysplasia. We've really introduced the idea about scoring and estimated breeding values. We've dabbled in talking about it's not compulsory, but it's for the greater good. Um, and that we've got a huge amount of information about some breeds and more breeds are beginning to appear, such as the Labradoodle. We're now going to hop on over to elbows because that's quite different. <laughs> um, the first big thing that, that blew me away when I started reading about this a few years back was hips. We've got a score of 106 and elbows we have three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't make any sense, but it is massively different approach. Why? Why is that? Um, 
it's a different screening scheme. It's a different scoring scheme. Um, my knowledge of the of the details of the disease is is, is not yeah. great um, because I'm not not a vet. But but my, from my limited understanding, that the, the hip dysplasia is a sort of incongruity of of, of the bones in the elbow joint. So they're they're, they're not perfectly formed in the right proportions and um, at, at different areas in the elbow joint. So there's the fragmented coronoid process, the unconeal, uh, ununited anconeal process and the osteochondritis desiccans. There's sort of slightly different locations in the elbow joint. And again, this sort of this, it's not a laxity, but it's, it's the sort of, um, uh, the sort of it's just this really morphine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and so it, it's manifest as these, I think primary lesions, which are these these little sort of um, fractures of, of bone and these little pieces of bone. Is that is that correct? That the yeah, 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 no, absolutely. No, you're doing great. Doing better than I can. Um, it's it's difficult to, as far as I understand it, with an X-ray, it's difficult to um, see these these mm -hmm. problems, and it's difficult to uh, evaluate the severity of these problems. There may well be methods of scanning that are um better at evaluating the severity of the problems but those methods are going to be much more expensive mm -hmm. so it, it's relatively cheap to, to get an x-ray done it's much cheaper than perhaps getting a cat scan done um yeah. and that may not even be the right scan to do it <laughs> so my... no 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 i just got a giggle because i thought of the joke, joke about labrador and a cat scan um yeah. just let me explain what we're talking about to followers so when you take an x-ray, it's a 2D image. It's a black and white image. And when you're looking at the hips, that can give quite a good representation. Um, but when you're looking at a 2D flat image of an elbow, by the way, we take the elbow from the side, the hips, we do them on their back with their, their legs stretched all the way back and you go from belly to back. Um, with the elbow, we're doing it from the side and you've got three bones there with a very, very complicated joint system there. So it's not this simple, simple hinge joint. There's lots of other stuff going on. So it can be really hard to see these quite subtle, what we call incongruities, which is just not a perfect fit. And it's layers of gray. So looking for the medial coronoid process, you're, you're having to look behind another bone on top of it. You know. Is it, is it slightly, you know, is it out of sync? Is there potentially a fracture there? So it's a lot, it's a lot harder. So what they do is they score it out of three. <laughs> and it's quite broad categories, isn't it? It's um, no signs of arthritis. And then there's moderate. Ingenuity. I, I can't remember them. Can you remember them? And the size of the size of the osteophytes, I think, is or the primary lesions is and is, is something to do with it. But yeah. the, the 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 biggest, I mean, the, the most probably the most important thing from a statistical analytical point of view is the proportion of dogs with a zero score. So you're right, it's one to three, but there's also zero. So it's four. It's four zero. categories. Um, four categories. But the 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 proportion of dogs with a zero score is huge it's about 80 yeah. percent or more in most breeds and certainly i think in those breeds uh, most labradors let's say labradors is, labradors is probably about 90 percent now so nine out of ten elbows labrador elbows that are that are, that are, that are x-rayed and then scored have a score of zero now right. there's probably they are probably not all the same in in condition or severity or incong incongruity it's just that we can't see the differences in yeah. so so really in that great big zero category we've got quite a lot of variation but we're mm -hmm. kind of having to treat them all as the same mm -hmm. and that's that's quite difficult genetics and, and and selection particularly depends on having that variation and for for you know there's lots of pros and cons to a lot of screening schemes and and, and there will be with the bba kc hip score scheme but one of the benefits of that is it's a truly quantitative scheme. It's got a really nice smooth curve and we've got, you know, it's skewed. Yeah, but we've got a lot of variation in there. And that that's really great because that mm. helps us. That's what that's our meat and drink with the with the, the elbows and having this huge. Variation. In each category. Board. Yeah. It, it, and, and we have little variation across the across the across the breed. 
Um, you know, even if we excluded all Labradors that had greater than a zero score, okay, so we exclude 10%. It's not very many. And no. you're not going to make, that's not a big push in terms of selection. You're not going to make very quick progress. Um, and so it's, it's, it's tricky. It's difficult. It's a difficult it disease. Because most, um, most referral centers that are playing with elbows now, they're doing, as you say, CT scans. So they can take a, a 2D black and white image and basically make it a 3D rotating model and they can start looking at different parts of the joint. And with that, I'm sure we'd be able to increase what we're scoring for. Just so people understand, um, hips, we add the values, you know, together. So it's out of 106, whereas elbows, we score on the worst elbow. So if you've got one that's naught and one that's one, the dog is score one. Um, I think both of us have come across as a bit negative about the value of this scheme. It's still very valuable, guys. It's very valuable and we should be doing it because out of all of the joints with OA, I think the elbow is the one that's breaking most people's hearts because it is so difficult to manage. And please go back in the videos on this page. There is a, um, a section of all the videos that we've done before, all of the Facebook lives. And if you can't find it there, go onto YouTube, type in canine arthritis management, type in a couple of keywords and you'll find all of these Facebook lives and find the one where I'm talking to Karen Perry, Dr. Karen Perry Butler. And we get to the elbow and, you know, the heart sinks because it is an extraordinarily difficult joint to manage. And the dog is that's where they load most of their weights is through their forequarters. And they, these joints are imperative for like weight carriage. So even though it hasn't got perfection and it's still quite broad and it's certainly got areas to improve, it's still worth doing. Um, and you know, how, what breeds would you say are, are partaking in this really well? What breeds need to? Is there, could we be, that's. Um, it's a sim sim similar profile of breeds. Um, I think, um, so it's those, those medium to large size dogs. Um, it's, uh, it's been, it's had a, a good uptake um, amongst dogs like, uh, breeds like Labradors, Golden Retrievers, again, German Shepherds. I think particularly the Bernese Mountain dogs, um, it was recognised, they recognised it as a, as a problem much earlier on. Um, and I think, I'm not entirely sure about the history of it, but I think they played a, uh, that club, that breed club, those breed clubs played a large role in, 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 in pushing in the UK mm. to, get, to get the scheme set up. Um, and also again, the Newfoundland with its, you know, it's, it's quite bulky. Um, but I, I, I'd, I'd reiterate and, and add to your point. Absolutely, you know, I, 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 I'm frustrated by the elbow screening scheme, not because it's it's a bad scheme, but because it's it, it, we can't get better data. Because it's a bad disease. It's not a bad scheme. It's a bad <laughs> yeah, disease. Yeah. And the, you know, it, 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 it's a, it's a difficult balance because you want an ideal screening. Um, scheme would be one that was really, really cheap, really easy to do, and, and everyone could do it all the time. Um, uh, but the, you know, so there's a balance between being very accurate in in terms of describing the severity of what you're looking for, and actually being very easy to do and, and giving you a lot of data. And, and you know, we could we could have a, a, a screening scheme that costs ten thousand pounds a time. Well, no one's going to do it. You know, no, it's just no, simple. exactly. So, um, but yeah, it's 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 we can still we can still use the data that comes from it, and we do use the data that comes from it, and and there perhaps as well because because of the the preponderance of those zero scores, the estimated breeding values, the EBVs can can be particularly useful because it then they break down into a more normal distribution, so we get that more graduated uh, distribution there, and, and and the information on relatives again becomes becomes more important. So when I saw you at the dog breeding reform group lecture which was back in october and this has been on the card since october guys so i don't let go until these people come online um and the dog breeding reform group please look them up fantastic woman that sets that organization up so it's a charity i believe isn't it and um insanely passionate person to to set up what she has done and once a year they do a kind of agm lectures don't they that's luna just jumping on the bed by the way <laughs> 
Um, and they have a AGM where they invite guests to come and speak. Now at that, it all got a little bit hot under the collar about whether people should be allowed to breed from dogs that have a score of one and above. Do you remember or did you just put it out of your mind? Um, and I can see where they're coming from a little bit. If naught is so wide, then really, should we be saying we, we really shouldn't breed if they've got one and above? What's your feelings on that? Um, I mean, yeah, absolutely. And I, I said a minute ago, you know, if you, if you only breed from zero dogs, um, which is which is that that um, uh, that policy, then you're really not exerting that bigger selection pressure. So, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it, 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 it's, it may be in, in, in sex and from one perspective is not a big ask. From another perspective, if you have a dog that is, um, has, uh, you know, wonderful attributes, great hips, clear eyes, great DNA test results, wonderful temperament, and, zero, uh, and an elbow score of zero one, mm -hmm. and you know that it fell down the stairs or something, you know, when it went, mm -hmm. it, um, does that preclude that dog from? with and mm. it's it's it, i guess it's a question that has no answer or has uh, you know means of answers when we each individually answer that question um mm. I, I would i would say well you know look look at the ebv um look at try and look at what the what the the genetics of that is see if that that offers counsel with the with the ebv you can look at trying to um, do a compensatory mating. So some of the, 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 the breeders that I've, I've counseled, we've looked at their... And they have a for say, elbow dysplasia, not a good one for hip dysplasia. So you say, right, well, you know, you, you've got a bit to give and you try and find a mate that's, that's, that has great hips and you've got a bit to give with the elbows and, you, you know, you're working for that like um, overall level. I don't think we've kind of like highlighted that. And um, when I was reading your paper, I just say Frontiers, I'm going to put on the bottom here and I'm going to do links to all the Kennel Club pages so people know exactly where to go and read more. But um, yeah, I, I guess I hadn't really thought about the fact that you could have a dog that's got poor scores, but with the EBVs, you're able to look back and go, well, actually, the genetics of this dog are going to be really good for this breed because this is likely to be a blip and this dog's going to bring with it so much other good traits that we want to stay in this breeding line. And I was like, oh my God, this is, this is complex, isn't it? So breeders that really get involved in this, they, they're taking it head on. Yeah. Breeding, breeding gets, breeding gets really, and it increasingly is getting, getting really tricky and, you know, going way back to our, the start of our conversation with DNA tests, you know, nice, simple, easy DNA tests where you just have clear care and affected. That's fine until you have 15 DNA tests to do in your breed mm -hmm. and, and nothing is going to be clear for everything. And all of a sudden no. you think, Oh God, you know, how, and, and, and it, it literally, you know, if we exclude anything, if we exclude everything that has a problem, then you're breeding from a really, really small pool of dogs and you're going to have a, a whole new generation of DNA tests in, in, you know, in, in 10 years time because, because they're going to crop up. So breeding management is, is yeah, it's tricky. It's, 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 it's hard. And, um, you know, the EBV tool is, is, is one thing. The, 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 the inbreeding coefficient tool is another thing. The DNA test results, that, that's all to try and help breeders make this decision. But, it, but it, it ultimately, I guess, it comes down to um to you as, as, as a breeder you know what do you think is right and what can you justify but I, I but i that having been said i think you should take that decision with as much information as you can possibly have which includes dna test results hip scores elbow scores and ebvs and then you can make that decision with as with an informed decision um mm. and you can let your puppy buyer know this is the work i've done this is what the, the steps that i've mm. take, taken and these are the decisions I've made for this reason. Um, and, 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 you know, you, you lay your, your cards on the table and, and, and you're being as, as, as honest as you can. Amazing. Yeah, I think it's amazing. Just, I don't know why, I've just had a flashback. Um, Leon Burgers, where are they at? Because I can remember, <laughs> this is a totally selfish, guys, just bear with. Um, I was at university, so we're talking 1996, I qualify. No, it's not, 19 doesn't matter anyway final year 
um, I looked after Liam Berger and the guy was amazing. The owner was so lovely. He um, sent me a book of poems and um, he was telling me about how they nearly got wiped out after the Second World War um, because German raids blah, 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 weren't wanted anymore. How's their genetic pool? Do you know anything about whether they've resurfaced and they've blossomed? Because they would have had a very small... Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're up and about. Actually, Leonbergers, I think, have got EBVs for hips and elbows at the moment. So they're, oh, wow. I think they were the latest breed to have EBVs for elbows. I think we added them for elbows, but they certainly are for hips. So, um, yeah, and they've, they've got a, a great brood health coordinator who's, who's, who's very engaged and, and, and trying to do a lot. Genetic diversity is, is one of their primary concerns, I think. And they're still yeah. not a, a, a huge breed in terms of numbers um but um it's about how that's managed and and you know being able to import breeding stock and move across borders has has, has been has been um crucial i think um but um yeah no they they're they're and they're fully on board with the hips and elbows i think and uh yeah so one thing i didn't mention is is the, the paper we look at six six breeds but actually the estimated breeding values for hip scores are available for 30 breeds um wow. and for elbow scores for seven so um you know we yeah. need a longer burn-in for the elbows but they're, hopefully they're coming no i think i i find it fascinating I, I find it so exciting that if we can persuade the public to understand if not persuade if we can help the public understand it then they can start requesting it and if they start requesting it then we're going to really put influence and that's kind of where cam came from by getting the public to understand about arthritis, then they can start asking for more management plans and they can drive the multimodal approach. Let's take it a step further. Let's get them asking when they're going to get their new pup. I want to know more about, you know, the background to this dog, which I think is essential. Um, let's go for a few more questions. You are really attracting long stuff here. Normally they look <laughs> sentences and I can keep up with them. Da -da 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 -da. Luna's also on Forever Cults. Okay, so the Lee France, my colleague is bilateral hip dysplasia and with having hydrotherapy is doing amazing. Nice thick muscles from swimming is kept in knee for surgery at bay and he's loving life. That's good. Swimming is great for hips. Loves it. Um, Celia Cohen, I totally agree regarding the problem with the elbows. As a cha chartered physiotherapist, I see so many awful elbows that are so far down the line, it's heartbreaking. I wish people would get their spaniel's elbow scored. I see so few that have ever been scored and people are breeding from them with poor elbows. Is spaniel something that is high on your list of having? Yeah, I mean that, that there's um with spaniels there's a I know there's a there's a disease, uh is it incomplete ossification of the humeral chondral yes. with springers, which is is um is uh, I don't know whether it's particularly prevalent, but it's a higher prevalence in springers than than in yes. other breeds. Um and yeah I, I can uh, yeah I I think any breed where it's a, where it's a problem and um, that that's something that, you know, the kennel club are kind of working on at the moment is how we get get that um, acceptance that, hey, you know, we have a problem and we want to we want to try and find a solution to this problem. Because once that we're in that place, then we can we can help the, the, the schemes are set up. Other schemes are being set up for other other things like, you know, cardiology and, and, and whatnot. Um, so and I think my perception sort of having been kind of in and around dog health genetics and health for, for 10 years is that certainly at the, at the, at the sort of at the front end, the breed health coordinators, there's a much more kind of open atmosphere and, and, and a desire to, Hey, let's sort this out rather than I think mm -hmm. perhaps sort of 10, 10, 15 years ago, it was almost a sort of tip, put your tin hat on and, and, and hunker down and don't, don't admit you've got a problem because someone's, you know, the moment yeah. you stick your head up, it's going to, and I think now actually, a sort of acceptance that you know stuff happens stuff happens to, to humans as well as dogs and we can you know we can try and work our way out of it and we've got these these tools and and actually it's far better to sort of um uh you know stick your hand up and and and, and work to, to to resolve it than to sort of stick your fingers in your ears and pretend it's not there i think that's really true and um i think as a vet quite often i get terrified by um breed organizations quite quite scary but um, I can put my terrified stuff and put it in my back pocket and go, actually, most of these guys are doing amazing things for their breeds. And as you say, if um, amongst the organization, amongst the breeding group, there is this, we shouldn't be ashamed. This, you know, if we have bad hip scores, it's, you know, there's lots of reasons that this has happened. 
but for the breed, and this is why we're all here, let's talk about it openly and not point fingers. Um, we could go on for ages. We've done an hour. Um, I, I, my list of questions, they're so long. <laughs> I'm struggling <laughs> to listen to you and actually read them. Um, breed health coordinators are doing a lot to educate prospective puppy owners to ask about health testing. That's good. That's from Liz Branscombe. Louise Ball, um, she's talking about her dogs. One is competing at rally and winning high place results and still enjoys agility. They both have zero elbow scores. A dog can still enjoy life to the full in an old age with low hip scores. Yes. Um, Chow Chow's a number one breed when it comes to bad elbows. Nearly 50% of all tested Chow's get elbow dysplasia. Yet in the UK, over 90% of breeders think it isn't necess necessary to elbow or hip score. I myself own a Chow and got bilateral elbow and hip dysplasia. Is that true? So are Chow's something that stands out to you? Um, it's difficult to it's difficult to um, uh, to comment if the if the data isn't there, and of course our data would be the screening scheme. Um, yeah. But I know I, I had been due to go and speak to um, one of the Chow um, clubs in June. Um, unfortunately, now we're all confined, so that's not no longer going ahead. But um, yeah, we we had been in touch with the Chow um, one of the Chow clubs. Um, so and I, I had looked at um, I had done some genetic analysis on the Chow scores, what what there is. Um, and I don't think they're quite there, unfortunately, with 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 enough scores at the moment. We, right. With EBV, you need to have a sort of, you want to have a reasonable proportion of the population scored. Um, so, you know, for for clumbers, that might be um, how how it, it might be a few hundred. For Springer spaniels, of course, that's not enough. So, because the clumber population is much smaller than the Springer spaniel population, so it needs to be a reasonable portion of the population. And for the chows, we're not quite there, but, you know, hoping to sort of really, really encourage them on with that. And, you know, we're engaging with the breed clubs and so we can push that on, hopefully. So tomorrow, if you're in any of the breed clubs, then yes, stick to your guns. And anybody that's got chow and was going to go to his talk, then organise it on Zoom and make it happen because we're all moving online. He has written it. You must do this. You must listen to him. Uh, I've just looked up my dog's EBV. Very interesting to look at your own dog. Elbows minus seven, 49 percent. Hips minus 16, 58 percent. I'm being such a nerd tonight. Explain that so people understand what Hannah's just done. Can you see? So, it? so sorry. The, the 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 estimated breeding value actually comes out as a, as an effect on the scale of which you've 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 the data you've used. We transform the data because with the hips, it's not. Um, uh, it's not normal, so we, we we have to transform it. So what we've done is we've taken the decision. So across all breeds and across all conditions, the average genetic risk for the last ten years over the last ten years is set to zero, yeah. um, and the standard deviation, which is like a, a measure, the average difference from the average, if you like, is set to twenty. And yeah. so across all breeds, um, across both hips and hip and elbow display scores. Um, if you've got minus 20, you're one standard deviation below the last 10 year average. And if you're plus 20, you're one standard deviation higher risk than, than yeah. the average of the last 10 years. So lower, lower is, is, is good. Um, you know, you can get down to dogs. I think I've seen minus probably minus 70 or so. And, and unfortunately, up the other way, plus 70, plus 80, which is, you know, which is wow. really, really high genetics. So the confidence is so we you know so ebv is the e stands for the estimate so it's our estimate of the genetic risk of the breeding value the genetic risk of, of, of that dog and obviously an estimate is is uh, <laughs> is, a, is, is a is a is an educated guess but the estimate is is based on or how good the estimate is is based on how much information you've had to to um to go on yeah. so for dogs which have their own hip score and have some progeny hip scores then the confidence we have in that is going to be quite high. We'll be up to sort of 75, 80%. Mm -hmm. um, by contrast, if we have a dog that doesn't have its own hip score um, and has, um, it doesn't have any, its parents hip scored or any relative, close relatives hip scored, then that confidence can get right down to, you know, 30%, something like that. Mm -hmm. So it may, in some senses, when you're comparing two dogs, you've got to bear that confidence in mind. If you're going for a dog and you see a dog that's got an EBV of minus 10 with a confidence of 85%, and then another dog with an EBV of minus 15, but with a confidence of 30%, you might actually be better off going for the first one. 
it's slightly wow. it's not quite as low a risk but it's a safer bet than the one that we're really you know we're really not so sure about so it's 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 worth you know bearing that in mind and, and, and reading through those those uh, those pages just just to tell you about it yeah so anybody that's reading Hannah Leach's stuff there so the minus seven was 49 percent confidence and then the minus 16 was 58 percent confidence so there's more yeah. confidence in the reading of minus 16 in the hips it's it's fascinating and I think for me I felt a little bit guilty that I've been it was 2002 I qualified god I had a brain empty 2002 so I've been qualified for 18 years and I really didn't have the level of respect for this that I should have done um I'd go through the motions we'd mention hips to some of the breeds you know the Labradors the German Shepherds have you thought about hip scoring but I don't really think that I took the the process of the scoring as as how how important it is so I'm hoping that this evening really gets that across to people that if we've got these dogs that have got arthritis, which is a major welfare issue, Vet Compass has told us this, yep. we know that it is one of the one, it's a disease that affects them for the longest and it's got the most severe clinical signs. So it features heavily in Vet Compass's work, OA, arthritis. Let's not stay there being reactive. Let's really think about the importance of going back in time and trying to prevent these dogs ever getting there. And that's really important. So take that home, guys. We're going to end just talking a little bit about environment because we can't leave it without hearing Tom say about the importance of environment very quickly. <laughs> going to start doing more. Let me leave. Let me leave. <laughs> but you said right at the beginning, and I think this is a, another little take home people need to hear, is that this is one part of the influence. And what we don't want, and I was quite rude um, in front of David Dykus yesterday as well, we don't want people going, oh, he's got a great hips. I'm just now going to let him jump out the truck and he can fall down the stairs and everything's going fine because he's bomb proof. It doesn't work like that, does it? No, no. And I mean, just as, you know, if you if you knew you had a kind of low risk of, of heart disease, it, do, it doesn't mean that you can, um, you know, never exercise again, take up smoking and just, you know, sit eating crisps all day. It's, it's not going to do you any good. So, um, no, absolutely. The, 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 the genetics um, and, and I think tying into this is, is a continued reason to score is that you know, the, the estimated breeding value, the EBV gives you an indication of the genetics, which is really useful for breeding. Yeah. But actually, the score itself has real value for your dog, for your individual dog, because that tells you the state of the dog's hips. And it, it tells you and informs you and your, your, your vet and your clinician what sort of management that dog's likely to need over, its, over the course yeah. of its life um, to, to, to ensure that hopefully it stays pain free. Yeah, and I think that's important. And I think also, tug on your heartstrings, guys. At some point, sadly, our dogs do leave us and we do get other dogs. If you're a dog person, you, you don't ever stop being a dog person. And you will need an EBV at some point. You might not need it now, but it might be in 10 years, it might be in 15 years, and you'll be thankful that you contributed to this scheme because you'll see, you'll reap the benefits later. Um, there was just one lady, I'm just going to go back, and um, I think she's from the US, and she was just bringing up the point about how dogs are neutered before they're going to their new owners, who then, you know, aren't doing these, these scoring because they don't have that anaesthetic available, that opportunity. Um, we're different here in the UK, we, um, we tend to not do it until, you know, six months, and there's definitely a trend now pushing for them being done even later with more evidence emerging that neutering can have effect on a number of diseases. So a lot of people are choosing to neuter later. So I'm sorry it's different in your country. Um, I think things will change over there too. Flying through, flying through. Uh, oh, yes, Laura, anyone getting a puppy or thinking of breeding needs to watch this. Rightly said. Um, thank you, Tom. You're absolutely lovely talk to um what i'll do if it's okay is i'm going to keep an eye on questions that come from here and um, we'll get transferred to youtube so people can search for it and listen it'll be 
remaining on our Facebook page. If people have questions, just put them in here. Even if it's three months down the line, we will get a notification that someone has written something and we will be able to try and help you out. So if you're watching this way after it was actually recorded, don't worry, put your question down. We'll try and help you. And if you don't get any reply from this, then type in info at k9arthritis.co.uk into your email, put it there and send it to us. Um, I'm going to put a load of links underneath this for people that want to go and carry on learning because we're all locked in. You've got to learn. Um, thanks, Tom. I'm really grateful. You've been fab all day. You've been fab feeding me info. So I feel much better. I feel like I understand a bit more than I did. So great. I think all the camp followers need to say thank you. And I'm going to say goodbye. See you later, Tom. Bye now.